This lecture provides an overview of assistive technology, orthotics, and medical interventions. Um, it's going to be kind of a brief, just kind of skimming over these topics, um, but by the end of this lecture, uh, my hope is that you'll be able to describe various types of assistive devices that can be used to promote motor function in children with disabilities, discuss basic orthotic interventions in pediatric patients, and have a general understanding of some of the medical management that may occur for individuals with spasticity. Successful assistive technology will fade into the background. So as physical therapists, our role is to kind of help provide individuals with a variety of devices and wheelchairs and walkers, um, standers, orthotic interventions, and even medical interventions that are going to help them function better. But the ultimate goal is so that they can participate in their daily lives and have fun, rich, interesting lives. And so their lives become not about the technology or the intervention, but about participation and living a full life. Now, when we talk about assistive technology for this lecture and this course, we're going to use the definition that is put forward by um, IDEA in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And under IDEA, children with disabilities are entitled to assistive technology devices and services. An assistive technology device is defined as any item, piece of equipment, or product system, whether it's acquired commercially off the shelf, modified, or customized, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of a child with a disability. There is an exception that this term does not include a medical device that's surgically implanted or the replacement of such a device. IDEA also defines assistive technology services, which we as physical therapists may actually provide. AT services are services that directly assist the child with a disability in selection, acquisition, or use of an assistive technology device. And this can really be a pretty broad definition. It can include evaluation, um, assisting with purchasing or leasing, selection, design, fitting, customization, adapting, maintaining, repairing, collaborating with other team members to kind of help um, select and uh, get those assistive technology devices, training caregivers and other individuals on how to use those dev devices, et cetera. So given the rather broad definition that we put forward um, previously, you can really understand that assistive technology really is a very vast area, and it can include um, communication devices and devices for activities of daily living and all sorts of um, different devices that help children function in their daily lives. Because we're physical therapists, um, for the purpose of this lecture and this course, we're going to kind of hone in today on assistive technology that's commonly used for positioning and mobility. Um, in particular, we're going to kind of uh, briefly review four primary areas. We're going to look at devices that provide dependent mobility, such as adaptive strollers or wheelchairs that are actually pushed by caregivers. Um, we're going to look at wheelchairs, power and manual wheelchairs that an individual can self-propel. We're going to talk about standers that can be set um, both all, in all three modes of prone, supine, um, or upright are also used as mobile standers. And then we're also going to touch briefly on gait trainers and walkers. So first, let's look at a couple of devices that can be used for d children who um, may be require dependent mobility. So these may be your children who are gross motor function classification level five, for example. Um, here on the left, you'll notice um, this is an adaptive stroller. Both of these products that you see here are made by the company Zippy. This is an adaptive stroller. Um, it is really looks very much, as you can see, like the basic stroller base of a stroller you might buy commercially. But the seating system is much different. So you can see um, here, and it might be a little bit difficult to tell in the picture, uh, but you can see that there's a, um, a five-point harness here in the stroller. There are kind of lateral supports and a headrest across here with kind of some wings that are, go around the head to help provide that head support. Um, there's also kind of a pommel or an adductor wedge here to kind of keep the legs from crossing over. Um, this particular seating system is shown here in a stroller base, but it actually can be um, removed from the stroller base and even put into a high-low base so that the stroller becomes then a seat that can be 
lowered all the way to the floor so the child can use it possibly to sit in their classroom, participate in things like circle time with their friends, or it can be raised to table height or even um, you know a high chair height for eating. So this is a fairly versatile piece of equipment, but it's also pretty um, limited to very young children because you know again, it's dependent mobility. It doesn't give the child any opportunity to move the stroller themselves. Um, and it's also a stroller which becomes um, not particularly age appropriate once a child gets to be kind of preschool age. You know, typically by age four or five, children aren't regularly in strollers anymore. So when you're making decisions about getting a stroller for a child with a disability, um, you may want to think about kind of the age of the child and what the family wants. Um, but also you may need to think a little bit too about what insurance is going to pay for. So if the child is, you know, getting ready to turn three and you know that insurance is only going to pay for a mobile device every three years, you may want to shy away from using a stroller because you'll know, number one, you're going to give that child three years with no opportunity for independent mobility, but also by the time they're six years old, that's not going to be a very age appropriate um, means of mobility. However, another consideration is that families often really like the idea of a stroller. They seem more um, common. It looks a little bit more typical to what other families use who have young children. Um, and, you know, many families kind of struggle with the idea of their child transitioning to a wheelchair. So this can be a useful device for young children or for families who are just not quite ready to talk about wheelchairs yet. And then here on the right is a just kind of a basic um, wheelchair. As you can see here, it's sort of tilted back. So most of the time these wheelchairs have tilt in space capabilities. Um, this particular wheelchair doesn't have a lot of extra supports, but typically um, a child who is impaired enough who's going to need a chair like this that's for dependent mobility is often going to require um, a chest harness, a seat belt, lateral supports, perhaps a headrest. And so you can really get a lot of accessories for these chairs um, to allow for a lot of support. Um, these chairs, as I said, have a tilt and space feature so that you can actually change the tilt and that can help with pressure relief um, and some of those sorts of things. They can be um, made here. You can see they have these swing away leg rests. These chairs don't typically fold very well and are quite heavy. So, um, you know, it is a consideration for a family in transporting that, um, that this chair, um, you know, may be difficult for them as, at least initially, or there may be some problem solving that has to occur to get, make sure that the house and the vehicle is accessible for this type of a device. Now here on this slide, you see wheelchairs that children are able to self-propel. So here on the left, you see a lightweight manual wheelchair. Now, a lot of times when we first start talking about manual wheelchairs with families, they think about kind of the um, typical general hospital wheelchair that's got the kind of sling seat and the folding frame, and that's what they think they're going to be getting. Um, most of the time, pediatric man manual wheelchairs don't have the ability to fold. And the reason for that is that the hardware and kind of the crossbars that have to go under the seat to enable folding add a lot of weight and are really heavy. And so the chair can be really lightweight if it doesn't have that folding capability. Typically the wheels will kind of pop off of the chair and then usually you can fold the seat down. So it folds into to somewhat into kind of a box, um, but it doesn't completely collapse. You can see here again, this chair has removable wheels. It has a very basic seating system. Again, you can add additional supports, but always remembering that the more supports you add, the heavier the chair gets. Um, this particular chair looks like it has a solid foot plate for a footrest, which um, can be helpful for children learning to transfer in and out of their chair, that they can actually use that foot plate to crawl in and out or as a step to crawl in and out. These chairs are um, designed so that you can actually stand on that foot plate and it won't flip the chair. And so it's very stable and is a nice way to teach kids to get in and out. Um, here on the left is also another wheelchair created by Zippy. It is a power wheelchair. And again, as you can see, um, it has, you know, it's kind of a basic chair seat with all the different kind of supports, the harness, the head seat, the headrest, the um, armrests, and here's your joystick control, which can be positioned depending on the needs of the child. And it's going to be on this motorized base. Um, there are power wheelchairs that have, you know, high-low capabilities and um, other features. Um, power wheelchairs are 
quite expensive. It's not unusual for them to cost twenty to thirty thousand dollars or more. They are very heavy. They require a specialized vehicle because they don't collapse at all. You know, you can't pop the wheels off. You can't lift it up because it's so heavy. So uh, while power wheel power chairs are an excellent solution for children with motor impairments who are unable to propel a wheelchair or who are just very inefficient with a wheelchair. Um, and evidence shows that infants as young as seven months old can be successful with power mobility. It is a big step and a big leap for families to take to move to power mobility just because it requires a lot of modifications of home and vehicle and really lifestyle in order to accommodate that kind of a chair. Here we see a couple of different types of standards. So on the left is the standard known as the Squiggles standard by Lecky. And if you get into pediatric therapy and you start um, learning about equipment and assistive technology, you'll notice that in pediatrics, everything is colorful and has a cute, fun name. So this standard on the, on the left here is the Squiggles standard. Um, it is set in this image, it looks like to be a supine stander. So you can see how the stander is set so that it's reclining backwards somewhat. Um, this stander can actually be reconfigured or kind of flipped around on that base so that it is also a prone stander so the child can be relatively in a prone position. And you can see here um, in the stander, you've got a headrest, you've got a chest prompt, pelvic, knee blocks, and then a foot plate here. These are highly adjustable. They're pretty lightweight um, and also have the wheeled base so that they're able to be uh, moved easily throughout the environment. Here on the right is a mobile stander known as the rabbit stander. Um, these devices can be um, great for children who, um, maybe for children, for example, with spina bifida, who have really nice upper body control and could benefit from some good standing, but that are also really mobile and social and can use those upper extremities to get around and wheel themselves around while they get that good weight bearing. Um, mobile standers are relatively new and getting them covered by insurance can often be a challenge because uh, many insurance companies are still kind of labeling these as um, products that aren't proven technology. So um, had wonderful success with these and families that get these almost always rave about how wonderful they are, but it's still difficult to get the funding for these. Here on this slide are some gait trainers and walkers that are commonly seen with children with disabilities. Um, on the left is a product made by Riften. It's called the Riften Pacer. It's a very popular common gait trainer. If you go into a clinic or a school setting, it's very likely that somewhere along the line, somebody had a Riften that they outgrew and they donated and there might be one sitting in the corner. Um, as you can see, it's got the um, wheeled base. It has um, arm prompts here. You can add... Um, leg straps to keep from scissoring. There's a lot of different um, parts and pieces and accessories you can add to this. Um, I, I can honestly say in my practice that I have found these though, these are pretty big. They don't turn particularly easily. They're kind of clunky. They make a lot of noise. There's a setting where you can actually do reverse locks, but then it, the walker actually clicks. So they are perfectly fine gait trainers, but probably not a first choice um, at least not for me, in my opinion. Um, here in the center is a crocodile walker. Um, unfortunately, the picture I have here doesn't have a child in the walker, but these walkers are used, it's actually an anterior walker. So what you're viewing here is actually the back of the walker. Um, if a child were in the walker, they would be standing with their back to us, holding the handles and then facing forward so that the walker was open in front of them. You can see here, this one in particular has a little flip down seat there so that um, the child can sit if they get tired. This walker also has additional, um, you can add arm prompts and pelvic supports, all sorts of things. Um, this is a walker that is really commonly used in pediatrics now. Um, for years and years, the there was a product made by the company K, K and it was just a silver metal walker with red handles, a K posterior walker. And we still see a lot of those out there but it seems like a lot of um, places are moving to something more like the crocodile. This is very lightweight, it's very easily maneuverable, and it has so many different accessories that you can really get almost as much support, if not as much support as you can with the Riften, but in a much lighter weight, more maneuverable um, device. 
And then all the way over to the right, this is a product called the Kid Walk. And so this is kind of a, um, you can see it, it, sort of a stander and a gait trainer in one. So it provides a lot of support and you can see it really straps. There's a, there's a little pommel here. There's pelvic strap and chest straps. You can also get, um, have a headrest. So it provides a lot of support and then it has the wheels on the side. Um, what you can't really tell on this static image though, is that this particular device has a little bit of wiggle up and down and a little bit of wiggle from side to side. So as the child steps and moves in the walker, it actually allows them to have some of that kind of medial lateral and anterior posterior sort of movement and sway that we all kind of naturally have during gait. So it gives them a little feedback, um, a lot of support and the ability to be mobile. Um, and it's a really nice device that a lot of families really love. And then finally, I just wanted to show you sort of a mishmash of other stuff that you might see in the assistive technology world for kids. Um, up here in the top left is a bath seat. So this is a, a seat that you can put in the bath and it can get wet. Um, over here to up at the top right is a product called the Scoot. It's a little floor scooter and you can see that you can configure it in different ways and get a child, you know, for a young child down on the floor and moving and mobile on the floor like they would be if they didn't have movement impairments. Um, down here is an adaptive seat. This one's called the Special Tomato. It's one that's commonly used and seen, but there are a variety of others. And then down here at the bottom right is an adaptive tricycle. And so you might even be helping families access adaptive tricycles and adaptive bikes. Most of kind of these things on the other stuff slide are not things that insurance will typically pay for. Although again, there's a lot of variation from state to state and insurance company to insurance company. And the wonderful thing about working in pediatrics is there are lots of other agencies that help provide equipment and funding for children with disabilities. So there are lots of outside funders that can help you fill the gaps if you feel like you have a child that really needs something and their insurance won't pay for it. So overall, the goals of assistive technology are first and foremost to facilitate participation. We want to get this child um, give this child the ability to participate in age-appropriate activities with his family, with his friends, and in the community. And we also want to allow the child to direct his energies towards participating in social and educational programs rather than maintaining posture and gaining mobility. So a lot of times assistive technology um, are really not about, they're not meant to be rehabilitation technologies. They're not meant to be therapeutic devices. They're really meant to be positioning devices or mobility devices that kind of help the child compensate for their weaknesses and participate with their friends and their family. We also wanna help the child um, improve their functional independence, you know, movement against gravity, um, allow them that proximal support to unlock some of those fine motor functions, give them an opportunity to participate in ADLs and work and play, and also the ability to communicate. So again, a lot of times once we get ch children in a good position and they're positioned well and they feel comfortable, we oftentimes see their ability to um, produce sounds and language or utilize communication devices improve. We also want to use assistive tech to improve quality of postural control, alignment, and movement. You know, we're trying to get the body aligned um, as good as possible, as well as possible. We're trying to keep the relationship in this of the center of mass over the base of support. Um, and we're really trying to minimize, prevent, or manage impairments, including prevention of secondary impairments. So we want to get that good alignment and that good posture um, so that we don't end up with secondary impairments that can later lead to additional problems, pain, or even uh, the necessity for surgical intervention. Some considerations when you're thinking about integrating assistive technology. Um, first of all, it does take some planning. Families have to kind of understand their options. And as I've mentioned with some of the devices, you know, sometimes you do open up um, issues for the family in terms of accessibility. They may need a ramp to get the device in and out of their home, or the school may need to solve some problems to get the, um, so solve some accessibility problems to get the child in and out of the building or on and off a bus. So you have to make those considerations and make sure that we're planning not just for kind of the financial piece or what we think the child needs for their movement and alignment, but also what's realistic for the family's life and their resources and really what they want. 
Um, we always have to make sure that we are aware and educating the families and caregivers so that these pieces of equipment aren't misused. We want to keep the child safe, and so we want them to be used safely, and we want them to be used properly. I already sort of touched on financial concerns, but again, we need to make sure that the family, you know, we were looking at the family's insurance coverage. Oftentimes, even families that have private insurance have deductibles. And you can imagine that if I have a 20% deductible at 80-20, um, and I have to pay 20%, um, if I'm purchasing a $10,000 wheelchair, that's $2,000 out of my pocket. And that can be a real hardship for families. So we have to help them plan for that financial piece and get them resources if they need assistance. There are a lot of psychosocial considerations when helping families um, access assistive technology for their children. Again, as I alluded to before, a lot of families, uh, you know, when they have a child with a disability, particularly one that is likely to be lifelong, there is a grieving process that occurs and it takes some time to get to the point to really accept um, that. And so Getting a wheelchair is is a big is is really a big part of kind of accepting that this is a child with a disability and this is something we're going to have to manage a long time, and some families struggle with that more than others, and so there can sometimes be some delays in getting that equipment just because we have to kind of help the family through that process from a psychosocial perspective and get them kind of at a place where they're ready to take the next step. And then again, another comment that or another um, item I touched on was. Um, thinking about assistive technology versus rehabilitation technology. Equipment, assistive technology is not therapy. So be very careful about thinking about, well, I want to give the child a manual wheelchair because I want their arms to get stronger. That's not really the intent of assistive technology. Assistive technology is to increase participation, to increase efficiency. And so if the child needs a power chair to get from class to class in a timely manner and to be able to you know, participate in the PEP assembly at the end of the school day, then what we should really be doing is getting the child a power chair. And then we can certainly work on you know, upper body strength and mobility in hopes that maybe someday they can propel that chair or maybe they also have a manual chair that they propel over short distances. But we don't want to take away function because we're trying to use that equipment for rehabilitation. And I think that's a really slippery slope that therapists often go down and it's often hard for us to kind of break away from that. But we have to really think about what are the child's abilities now and what do they need from this equipment now? This is not a piece of equipment for therapy. It's to optimize their participation today. So moving on, I just want to touch on orthotics as another area that you may be involved in as a pediatric physical therapist. Um, of course, there are a variety of orthotics, spinal, upper extremity, and lower extremities. We're going to kind of focus on lower extremity orthotics um, for the purposes of this lecture, and particularly we're going to look at arch supports, supramalleolar orthotics, or SMOs, ankle foot orthotics or AFOs. And then um, we're not going to look very closely at them, but I also just want to make sure that you're aware of um, KAFOs or knee ankle foot orthotics or HKAFOs, hip knee ankle foot orthotics, and even RGOs, which are reciprocating gait orthotics. So one of the resources that um, I shared with you guys in preparation for this lecture is a, from a company called Cascade. Now, there are a lot of different vendors and orthotists that make pediatric orthotics. Cascade is probably one of the largest manufacturers, makers of pediatric orthotics in the country. And in fact, many pediatric orthotists actually cast and fit children for orthotics, but send it off to Cascade to make the device. Cascade calls their products DAFOs, D Dynamic Ankle Foot Orthoses. So you'll often hear people talk about DAFOs in the pediatric world. Um, I'm going to use Cascade products um, to just to kind of walk you through the different types of orthotics. But again, this I, I want you to be clear, this is not some kind of commercial for da Cascade or anything like that. It's just I want you to know that companies out there because it's so common. And also, they it just provides kind of a nice framework for going through the different types of orthotics. So here um, you can see this is a, a picture of some of the products that Cascade offers. 
And it starts kind of as the, um, at the top left and the kind of the least restrictive and builds up to sort of the most restrictive. So starting down here at the bottom um, is a minimum control foot orthosis. They call theirs the hot dog. So you'll see some of them, they have some fun names for some of their products. And so they call this one the hot dog. It isn't off the shelf. It's not custom made. Most of the time, insurance will not cover these. Um, I believe they cost, you know, about 30 bucks. So they're not super expensive. Um, Cascade will actually send you a um, paper that you can put the child's foot on and measure their foot to figure out what size they need. And then you can have families call or get online and order these directly. So um, the evidence is pretty um, limited in terms of whether... Uh, a simple kind of arch support is really helpful or necessary. In fact, for the most part, evidence shows that for children who pronate, an arch support doesn't really provide um, or make much of a difference. But in some event that you might think you want to use something like this, a hot dog is not a bad choice. Um, then we get into some kind of foot orthoses that offer a little bit more control. So you can see they kind of come up around the foot. There's still a shoe insert but they kind of come up around the foot, offer a little bit more control um, for that, probably more oftentimes that pronation. Coming on up down here, um, the DAFO 4 and the DAFO 4 Softy, these are what we call SMOs or supramalleolar orthoses. And so oftentimes children who need, have um, a lot of very strong kind of pronation, um, who need a lot of control around the ankle, many times children with um, Down syndrome who have really low tone and some of them pronate so much they roll over so that their medial malleoli are almost touching the ground. These are kids that often can benefit from wearing a SMO. Um, you can see that it leaves that ankle really free kind of free ankle plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So it doesn't really control around the ankle, um, but it does do a lot of nice control around the foot. And it also, for kids who are still doing a lot of floor skills, a lot of crawling and pulling up, it's, it's a lot less restrictive on those types of movements than an AFO. And then finally, um, the rest of these are all AFOs. And so you can see kind of the different types um, hinged versus not hinged, elastic straps in the front versus no elastic straps, um, whether they have a plantar flexion or dorsiflexion block or they have some free dorsiflexion. Um, Cascade, the Cascade DAFO guide that I posted for you has a really nice description of all the different AFOs and the different features that they have and why you might use them. And so I really would encourage you to kind of bookmark that, file that away, and go back and look at it um, when you're out in practice, it can provide you a nice guide for thinking about orthotics for children. And also when you're out in practice, remember, you know, you're going to be working with orthotists that are going to be helping you as a, as a team kind of make these decisions. So, you know, you're not going to necessarily be the only one. Um, you'll be giving your opinion and talking about what you think the child needs, but there'll be a team of people that are helping make these decisions about orthotics. And the primary goals of orthotics are to prevent deformities, prevent or correct soft tissue deformities, controlling undesirable motions while allowing normal motion, protecting weak muscles, and controlling deviations associated with abnormal muscle tone. And so really that kind of gets at the heart of it. When we start looking at um, orthotic intervention, especially for the uh, ankle, foot, and ankle, and knee, um, oftentimes we're trying to address kids who are either extremely low tone and so they're pronating and kind of collapsing um, they, and on that foot, they might be hyperextending their knee, or we might have kids that are very high tone and they're up on their toes and kind of doing some abnormal postures that way. And we're trying to get some control and some good alignment to help make them more stable um, and also prevent those secondary uh, impairments. And the last thing I want to touch on today is um, how we might, you might see medical management of children that you work with who have spasticity. Now, again, this is not something that you're going to be doing in practice, but you may be working with a physician and providing recommendations or consultation on how to best manage this child's spasticity. So I've got some different, um, very common methods of managing spasticity listed here. Um, first of all, the kind of the least invasive is oral medication. So you might see some antispasmodics like diazepam or baclofen or dantrium. Um, you also may see children taking anticonvulsants, um, which are treatments for seizures. Um, you might see Neurontin, 
um, is a very common one. There's also um, Lamictal, Trileptal, Topamax, and Zonagrin are some that you might hear, but Neurontin is one of the most common. And then you may also um, have children who are taking anticholinergics, and some of those might include um, Cogentin, Sinomet, Robinol, Chemadrin, and Artane. And those are really for um, uncomfortable body movements, maybe those children who have dystonic CP, maybe some dro- uh, to help with kids that tend to drool. So those are kind of the three categories of oral medications that you might see in children who have spasticity. You also might see um, injections. And so one common injectable medication is botulinum toxin, also known as Botox. And yes, this is the same Botox that um, people, plastic surgeons put in people's faces to relax muscles um, to decrease the look of wrinkles. Um, Botulinum toxin, uh, it prevents synaptic release of acetylcholine from the nerve terminal, which interrupts muscle contraction. So it basically blocks muscle contraction that way. Um, Botox injections are very, are usually quite local. Muscles are injected individually and it usually takes a couple of weeks for the full effect to kick in. And then that effect lasts for a few months. And during which time you really want to work on underlying motion and strength of those muscles, and then it will wear off. Um, Another way that antispasmodic medication may be delivered is through a pump. And often we hear of an intrathecal baclofen pump. An intrathecal baclofen pump is actually a pump that's surgically implanted and it pumps baclofen into the spinal cord to increase inhibition in the motor neuron pools. And um, this is actually a fairly invasive process and invasive surgery and intrathecal baclofen pumps have a fairly high um, rate of failure and um, complications. So you'll see um, some physicians are somewhat hesitant to implant intrathecal baclofen pumps. And then finally, kind of the most um, invasive type of medical intervention for spasticity would be surgery. So there are muscle releases, which are just simple releases to kind of lengthen the muscles and make them less tight. Um, But there's also a pretty major surgery that some children with cerebral palsy have called a selective dorsal rhizotomy. And an SDR involves cutting some of the sensory nerve fibers that come from the muscles and enter the spinal cord. So this results, um, basically the surgeon is going to kind of selectively cut abnormal rootlets, trying to leave normal rootlets intact. The idea is that this is going to reduce messages from the muscles, resulting in a better balance of activities of nerve cells in the spinal cord, and thus reduce spasticity. As you can imagine, though, once those nerve rootlets are cut, um, they, that's a very permanent um, surgery. It's not something that wears off. It's not something that can be undone. So this is a very significant surgery. It's a very big surgery. It's an irreversible surgery and one that needs to be thought carefully about before proceeding. And this is really just another way to put together all of those medical um, interventions that I just talked about. This is actually um, based on a, a triangle created by a physician in here in Kansas City who I work with, Dr. Ganesh Gupta. And um, Dr. Gupta kind of um, visualizes spasticity man- management using this triangle. So the apex of the triangle is function, the functional goal. That's what we're trying to get. Um, he has here in red, the therapy box over to the left. He really likes to utilize um, what he calls standard PT and OT, so kind of clinic-based PT and OT, but he also really likes functional PT and OT, so community-based programs, as well as alternative therapies, such as um, he recommends a lot of his patients do things like therapeutic course writing and martial arts. And then here in the, uh, surrounded in the green is what he refers to as the medical triangle, which are the interventions that I just told you about, which are organized here in terms of risk from the lowest risk on the bottom um, up to the most risky surgeries um, on the top, which here is intrathecal baclofen, although um, probably selective dorsal rhizotomy, if it were included in this triangle, would be the most invasive. So you can just see here, this is just, again, this isn't new information. It's just another way for you to kind of visualize and think about how spasticity is managed for children with cerebral palsy. And in the end, a a really important note by Susan Efkin, who is a very well-known 
um, school-based physical therapist. And Dr. Efkin says, once spasticity is altered through medication or surgery, motor, normal movement does not just emerge. The underlying secondary muscular changes, such as weakness and contracture, can still impede movement. The child has also learned motor patterns that are different because of the previous presence of spasticity. Once the spasticity is decreased, those learned motor patterns do not just disappear and they are potentially not effective for the new lower tone situation. And so all of that is to say that when we are working with children, whether we are providing them with devices or orthotics or spasticity management, as Dr. Efkin's talking about here, you know, one um, very important message, I think, is we don't want to take something away from a child unless we can give them something better. So... If they are using their tone for movement, um, we need to be sure if we're going to take that away that we're going to be able to rehabilitate them and strengthen those underlying muscles. And in the end, we're going to give them something better. And so those are some really um, thought-provoking things that we have to think about as physical therapists. And we need to really be vocal members of the team in making these decisions so we can really look at the long-term goal and the function of the child. And so that concludes our discussion of assistive te technology, orthotics, and medical interventions.